I think today is one of those days if I just sat down and didn't deliver a sermon, I don't think you'd notice. You'd remember that. Thank you, Fiona. I know you've been holding on that for a couple of weeks. And the wait is worth it. That was fantastic. Our um, second scripture reading comes also from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Now he had to go to Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water. A Samaritan woman. Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whatever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said to me is quite true. Sir, the said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he, the word of the Lord. I want to share this piece by Annie Dillard, written in Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. When I was six or seven years old, growing up in Pittsburgh, I used to take a precious penny of my own and hide it for someone else to find. It was a curious compulsion. Sadly, I've never been deceived by it since. For some reason, I always hid the penny along the same stretch of sidewalk up the street. I'd cradle it at the roots of a sycamore, say, or in a hole left by a chipped off piece of sidewalk. Then I'd take a piece of chalk and start at either end of the block, draw huge arrows leading up to the penny from both directions. After I learned to write, I labeled the arrows, surprise ahead or money this way. I was greatly excited during all this arrow drawing at the thought of the first lucky passerby who would receive in this way, regardless of merit, a free gift from the universe. But I never lurked about. I'd go straight home and not give the matter another thought until some months later, I'd be gripped again by the impulse to hide another penny. It is still the first week in January and I've got a great plan. I've been thinking about seeing. There are lots of things to see, unwrapped gifts and free surprises. 
The world is fairly studded and strewn with pennies cast broadside from a generous hand. But, and this is the point, who gets excited by a mere penny? If you follow one arrow, if you crouch motionless on a bank to watch a tremulous ripple thrill on the water and are rewarded by the sight of a muskrat kid paddling from his den, will you count that sight a chip of copper only and go your roof away? It is dire poverty indeed when a man is so malnourished and fatigued that he won't stoop to pick up a penny. But if you cultivate a healthy poverty and simplicity, so that finding a penny will literally make your day, then since the world is in fact planted in pennies, you have with your poverty what a lifetime of days. It is that simple. What you see is what you get. So I'm continuing my sermon series on the missional church. I'm at that point where I can't remember them all now. So I've talked about the missional church as being sent, being incarnational, contextual, church is kingdom. And this morning I want to talk about the church being in the business of cultivating. At home, we got a microwave. You put in food in there for a few minutes, hot water, I think for 30 seconds, instant meal, instant coffee. Curry is instant coffee, in a way. No, no say that. I have a TV, I don't turn it on very often. I don't know how many hundred channels there are or how many streaming services we have. Instant entertainment. Poof, there it is. We've lost it. I know when I met my wife, before she was my wife, obviously, we spent time on the phone, a lot of time on the phone, and we spent time talking to each other, getting to know each other. And after 32 years, I can say, we have and we continue to cultivate our relationship. I've never been on one of them apps that goes, nope, nope, whoa, I hope so. <clears throat> Instant relationships. We live in that world, we want the moment. And we celebrate the moment, Pentecost. We're celebrating a moment when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. We call it we recognize it as the birthday of the church. We usually have another cake we want to put candles on it. Man, that'd be a lot of candles. We need a fire sandwich. We celebrate moments. In a little bit, we'll celebrate another moment at this table. We celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. I think what we lose sight of is Time. and the idea of cultivating. The gardeners in the group, I think, will agree with me. You put a seed in the ground, not an instant plant. It's got to be fertile ground, you got to water it, make sure it's got adequate sunlight, got to take care of it, make sure the wind doesn't blow it away. Way too much work for me. God bless the gardeners. <laughs> I'm surprised I was holding Come on, y'all give an amen to the gardeners. Amen. You appreciate that, right, Deborah? Um, yeah, our deck looks really beautiful. Um, we spend so much time, and churches do this. Hmm, we need more people. We need an instant program. Let's hit Amazon. Let's hit the church down the street. We need an instant fix. Every once in a while, somebody will strike lightning and get in a bottle, and they'll have an instant fix. Boom, here comes 50 new members. Wow, great. For most of life, it doesn't work that way. Jesus comes to Jacob's well. And tradition says that Jacob's well is still there. I've been to where they say it is. Still has water. They have this beautiful silver bucket. They drop it down. They pull water out. And for about 10 bucks, they got this little vial. They put water, put wax on it. And I can say, the wax didn't hold the water. It's all evaporated. And he comes and he starts to talk to a Samaritan woman. First off, he's a Jew. So he's going to talk to Samaritan. They don't like each other. There's a sermon right there. 
Then Jesus is talking to a woman. There's a sermon right there. I'm not doing any one of those today. Jesus could just as easily have rendered to this woman a sign, a miracle, with the pronouncement that he was God. Instead, he takes the time to have a conversation. She has no idea who he is. And he talks about water and what he provides, living water. Talks about worshiping on mountains. Talks about the distance Samaritans and the Jews. <coughs> and then she makes the point, we know the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one, is coming. After all that, he finally says, yep, I'm here. And you know someone that she's going, really? And it made sense. And for my brothers and sisters in the faith who say that women shouldn't be preaching, <clears throat> got news for you. Samaritan woman's first one to proclaim. But he takes the time to cultivate, he takes time to share, to interact. The missional church, the church founded on a theology of mission, who we are supposed to be, is not looking for that road to Damascus moment, that lightning strike, that instantaneous miracle. For patience, we seek out new relationships, even with Samaritans, even with women, even with others. Regardless of everything, we sit with them and we share with them. We cultivate friendships. Take a moment if you want. Think back on your deepest friendships. And yes, I'm a romantic heart. I do believe in love at first sight. There's still cultivating going on. There's still growth. We have to be patient. The original church isn't about moments. Not specifically. For life is nothing more than a series of moments. There's that moment of our birth. There's that moment of first day of kindergarten. There's that moment of graduation and graduation graduation, and that, and that, and that. Moment of marriage. Moments of anniversaries. Moments of holidays remembered. But all these moments are sequences in the cultivation of life. Friendships. We jest, only partially. Visitors come to the stereotypical church, first church of whatever. They walk in the door, hi, welcome to first church. We're very courteous and welcoming, and here's your pledge card. The expectations, they've walked in and you've got them. Church has been struggling with this. Something long I've been around longer. How do we start new friendships? We don't even think about it in our own personal lives. We just start. You get a new job, you move in the office, you make contact, you start asking people about their personal lives. What do you like? What do you not like? You're in Houston. What baseball team do you like? The Yankees leave. And you start growing. One penny at a time. One penny at a time. I remember early in the pandemic, Ryan and I were talking about this yesterday in a walk. For a while, all the paths. People would put treasures, They'd take little rocks and paint them, leave little notes, leave pictures. And Ryan and I got to call them treasures. And for the most part, we take pictures, which is kind of rude to take the treasures, but we'll share them. 
Except every once in a while, there was one or two that I just couldn't refuse. I do remember one time we were walking on one of our duck ponds, and somebody planted a rock there with the Astros logo on it. Yeah, I couldn't read that, sorry. It's at home. But it was fascinating to walk this path and wonder what's the next treasure. And I miss those days. Because I like my walk. I love my walk. I love my walk to find me a great conversation with my dog and everything else. But collecting those pennies and building on them. And that's what we're called to do. When you meet somebody for the first time, and you ask, So what good happened to you this week? There's your first penny. What are you looking forward to? There's another penny. All right, friend, nobody's got an easy life. What challenges we face this week? There's another penny. You may not think, well, I don't want their problems, but when they share with you, that's a piece of gold. They've shown trust, and the friendship has borne fruit. But it takes time, and it takes patience. The missional church cultivates. We celebrate moments. We're celebrating several this morning. But there are moments that have been cultivated over time that build and tell a story. The story of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious, loving, merciful God, we do love to tell the story. All the stories. We love to tell the stories of our lives. We love to tell the story of your life. We love chasing the treasures you have planted throughout our lives, accumulating the little gold nuggets, family, friends, experiences, precious moments. <coughs> oh, how we love chasing you, Lord. Lord Jesus, fill our hearts with an encouragement, an enthusiasm, and a patience. That this day we'll find a new penny and hold on to it while we have the courage to chase the next one. And may we always pursue you. All these things we pray in your name.
serve myself O C D, but every time I come to the table I'm always making adjustments. <clears throat> oh how the church in ages past and even today tries to put barriers between God's people and the feast. How they have to believe a certain way, be baptized. How so many have forgotten this is not our table. This is our Lord's table. Prepared and served by his very hand. A gift for the ages. To all. I do need all. Who call in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is so right. Give our thanks, our praise, our all to the creator of life. Lord Jesus, we gather at your table, seeking your spirit, that our hearts may be nourished. We gather to offer prayers and songs, giving thanks to the moon and the sun stars, the oceans, and the mountains, for friends, for family, the cats and the dogs and the deer, for the fish in the sea and the birds of the air, for the food we eat and the water we drink. And we realize very quickly we cannot thank you for all the blessings you have given us. We gather at your table to celebrate moments, moments like today. Celebration of your spirit coming and birthing your church. A moment celebrating that time long ago in that upper room. Moments like birthdays and anniversaries. Moments like memories of sitting with a friend over a table. Of playing in a park with our children. Memories like vacations. Memories like simple conversations. We come to your table, O oh God, also with heavy burdens. This morning around us are 32 candles, and they barely scratch the surface. But the pain continues to grow. We come to you with a burden of war. Russia and Ukraine, we thought it would be over. And yet the suffering, the pain go on and on. It doesn't make the headlines, Lord. People are still suffering from cancer. The headlines have been pushed to the back of the paper. And people are still suffering from COVID. And the pain goes on and on. Lord God, we long to feel your healing touch. We long to feel it in our pain, physical, mental, and spiritual. We long to see your healing touch on our neighbors, the one across the street, the 
runs across the country, the ones around the world. Father God, we come to your table for so many reasons, but we come together in you. Lord Jesus, each of us seeks you. We give thanks, we ask for healing. Ask that you lift the burden. Ask that you encourage us and lift us up. Each of us has a prayer to all. We pause and offer you our prayers in silence. Bread together and take the cup as you feel called out of that back to us. Give us a God.
Hey, you can be nervous. The same way our Lord took the cup, curled up, saying, This is a sign of the new covenant. Sealed in my blood. Shed for the sins. Our Lord told his friends that he would not partake of the fruit of the vine. That was like anything. It felt weird to do so. Or to do so in remembrance of him, or to do so in his very real presence. It's his time in this place. Or to do so in the comfort of his promise. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this table. Thank you for this moment and all the moments that it has brought together. We gather that our hearts be nourished. That in this world, this creation, let us not look down constantly. But let us look up to you. Let us be encouraged. Reminded that in your creation there is great love and you are there. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. All who are willing and able, please stand as we affirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed. Friends, those who definitely seek to follow the Christ. What do you believe? Believe in God.